That's seriously the only joke I know. That's the only joke you know. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so here we go. The room's starting to fill up. All right, guys. We want to welcome you on Facebook Live. We've got all of our presenters here at First Form Headquarters. Make some noise. Physique Summit 2017. <laughs> Obviously, glute training is huge right now. That's a big new back training, I guess. Um, but I know you need to increase volume if it's a hard body part for you to bring up. However, there's a lot of controversy about um, the, volume, the amount of volume that glutes can take. So as far as training them every day, um, you know, training different parts of the glute, what, what are your thoughts on that? So it's a really great question. And yes, obviously, glute training is very in right now. Uh, I guess in. Uh, so what I would say is just like any other muscle, I mean, of course, it's a little bit different like, than like your calves or something, but you want to train with more volume, but at some point you can only do so much, right? And you have to think about things as a whole and you have to think about the long game, really for anything fitness related, but specifically training, because you're going to run into injuries and things of that nature, and that's definitely not what you want. So you can do things that are easier, kind of like what John was talking about, like pump work, or like maybe like you guys know the bands are really popular right now, like band around your knees and do different stuff like that. You can do that, I would say, very, very frequently, maybe every other day. I wouldn't really do every day. Um, maybe Brett Contreras would say otherwise, I'm not really sure. So I'm not the glute expert, he is, but I would say I wouldn't do, I wouldn't train more than three days per week, even if it is a weak body part. Um, specifically just because I do know of overuse injuries and just chronic stuff. So if it is lighter, I would prioritize that. Um, but do anything that is a traditional movement, maybe a compound lift, like a hip thrust. Don't just do that every day because, oh, I just want my glutes to get bigger. You still have to periodize things and you have to have recovery and you have to have you know, overreaching periods and it has to undulate. So think of it that way. Um, I would say up to three days per week would probably be good. Uh, and adding in things like the light work, pump work, body weight, banded type stuff is totally appropriate. You can really kill the volume on that and I wouldn't be worried about injuring yourself. Does that answer it? Real quick before we go to the next question, so two things. If you want to stream this, definitely stream this, the whole thing, Instagram, Facebook. You're more than welcome. Go ahead and stream this. And the other thing for the presenters up here, something that Cliff and I do every year, so I want you to think about it. At the very end, we always go down the row, and we, there's one thing that we want to give back to the audience, one thing that you think they can take home and benefit from. And it can be anything that you want, so be thinking about that, and we'll end, we'll end with that. So next question. This one's to both uh, John and Andy. Let's talk podcast for a second. What uh, benefits have you seen from that? What are some of the problems you've seen with doing it? Uh, what's your just overall experience with running it? Uh, as far as like social impact, I, I mean, the, the, the whole, the way we came about starting a podcast was I was writing a number of books and uh, we, were, we were doing the audio transcriptions and I don't know if it was me or Vaughn who was like, you know, hey, we just make this a podcast. And it was kind of an accident, and uh, I didn't know anything about it. But the social impact of creating good content through audio, um, everybody's good at different things. Like certain people are good on video, certain people are good with audio, certain people are good with writing. And I know that every single person in this room is good at one of those three things, whether you think you are or not. And I think it's important to find the things that you're good at and, and kind of go all in on those things. Uh, for me, I'm very good with audio, and it was just kind of a natural thing. So uh, for me, um, I think it's an incredibly useful, incredibly underrated social tool. Everybody's all in on Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat, 
and uh, podcasts are making a huge comeback. People people prefer to listen to things they're interested in rather than mindless chatter on the radio or uh, you know anything else. So uh, I found it extremely useful. I would say that all my social relevance, virtually all of it, has come from the podcast. Um, it's very easy. It's very cheap to get started. It's very simple. And uh, if it's something you're interested in, I would definitely go go check it out and, and commit to it. Don't just do like, hey, I'm going to try this out for a week and see how it goes. You know, the first podcast, the first two podcasts we did, we were getting like 50, 60 downloads. You know, now we're getting 1.3 a month, 1.3 million a month. So, I mean, it just takes time like anything else. So, you know, stick it out. So the one thing that I can add and speak for myself and Sal and Tyler and, and Dr. Chad over here is when we started the training in Nutrition Truth, do you want to answer that live? That would be, that would be awesome. <laughs> Time out? No? Okay. Yeah. Damn, dude. So with the TNT podcast, here, here's what the biggest thing that we learned, myself, Sal, Chad, and Tyler, was when we very first started off, and Scott, you were the one that asked, asked the question. When we first started off, we probably did, what, 10 episodes, Sal, that we ended up completely scrapping? Because Sal explained it to me this way, and it made a lot of sense. He was like, you know what? That, that was preseason. All right, we're going to scrap that. Now we're in a good groove and now we're going to go. So it's one of those things where you have to really get comfortable and find your groove. And the other thing about the TNT podcast that works really well is not only do we bring in other people that are influencers and experienced, um, that's really, really key. So instead of just having the same people talk about the same stuff, that's important, but you need to have a well-rounded group with personality. So we have Chad, the researcher, we've got um, you know, you know what, Brian's back there as well, and Sal, they're the bros, all right? Teach and I are kind of half bro. We're diet coaches. We have this really well-rounded atmosphere, and we feed off of each other. So those are some of the things, but when you first start, don't be afraid to scrap 12 episodes and start all over, because at the end of the day, it's what's been. But also, don't forget to start, because yeah. a lot of people scrap every fucking episode and never start. So it, you've got to know when to draw the line on that. How many did you? How many did you scrap? None. No, like you didn't start over or anything. You just went. No, if you go back and listen to episode one, two, three, four, five, up to like thirty, they're terrible. They're still up. I left them up for a reason because there's a lesson in that. The lesson is nobody knows how to do something; they just do it, you know. And then after many, 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 many times of practice, just like you guys have worked out a fucking thousand times, you get to know what you're doing, and that that's you know, I I. I can see your point, but you have to be careful who you say that to because some people will never start like that. You know what I mean? I agree 100%. Who's next? Where's Gary? Yeah, make, make sure you raise your hands high so he can find you. So this is for John. Um, you talked a little bit yesterday about, or this morning, about salt intake. And then about a week ago, you had mentioned to me about so I, I, I get the the overall salt intake, but you'd mentioned about taking salt in specifically pre-workout, like especially for a, like a metabolic conditioning type workout. Can you ex expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so if you really think about it, salt's one of those things that a lot of people you do have in your diet, but a lot of people, they don't really pay attention to it. They don't track it. And so if someone's really focused on performance, whether it's you're just trying to get stronger or, or maybe you're doing CrossFit or maybe you're getting ready to do Metcon or whatever the, the, you know, the workout of the day or whatever that is, a lot of people, they don't go in, they don't have their electrolytes in a good place. So the nice thing is I like to recommend a high, uh, a meal pre-workout with high salt. And if you're not someone that has a lot of salt in that meal, maybe you actually just put it in your intro workout drink and you drink it during training. Now, you know, I touched on this, so I want to pass this off because there's other good guys that might have a little different take on that. I know you, you feel a certain way about salt pre-workout. Yeah, I, I, I typically use, I, like John said, if you're not having a pretty high salt sodium intake in your diet, adding some to your pre-workout shake. But I even like to add a little bit of like Morton's light salt because that way you're getting some potassium in there as well. Because salt's primarily going to be found in like extracellular compartments and in blood. So it will help a lot with the pump, but potassium's going to be primarily found intracellular and the intracellular spaces. So if you get a little bit of both, you're probably going to end up with a better pump and better outcome from your training. So I would recommend a little bit of... I, I Typically, I prefer, uh, do a combination of 
maybe like a, an eighth teaspoon of Morton's light salt, which contains both potassium and sodium, and then a fourth, uh, an eighth teaspoon of regular salt. And so you get a little bit of the best of both worlds there. Hi. Um, my question is in regards to Peak Week. So I guess I can reference back to you, Andy, saying, like, you've got to start somewhere. And so I guess all the coaches, walk me through your basics uh, of Peak Week. Do you mock your clients? I know it's like a, a huge question, but there's so much out there. It's so confusing. Um, you know, for myself competing, I never know. Could I? I mean, I can always be better, but. Could I have been better at that show if I would have peaked better? Or so, and then for my clients as I branch out into doing prep for people, I guess. Nobody wants to touch that. So Andy just brought up a great point. That's something. If you have a coach, you need to listen to your coach. Not saying that you do or don't which I know we're going to get that question because I talked to somebody yesterday. You definitely need to listen to your coach. And the other thing is, it doesn't matter, like, we'll spend an hour on this if we're not careful. I know a lot of people have heard our take on Peak Week a lot. I mean, a lot. The last two years. Did the talk? Yeah. So, people haven't heard more, um, as much from Alberto, John, and Jason. So, I think if, if we want to let them go, if you're good with that, because they've heard us talk. Let's see, I think bodybuilding is um, not so much anymore, but it, it's strange in that, um, you know, usually the way other sports work is that, you know, what you do on game day is something that's, like, predictable. You know what's going to happen on the other end. Uh, it's often it's something that you've rehearsed many times, right? You just, you, you plan to peak on, on that day, so, but, but you kind of know what's, what's going to occur. Um, and so, so to me, like what people were doing like 10 years ago, we're, we're going to like cut water, cut sodium, do all these things that we haven't done up until this point, I think is, is risky, is misguided. I've never really seen it work out in practice, right? Um, one thing that we aim for, especially um, the first few times peaking an athlete, is that you, you, you want to aim for predictability. And uh, in recent years, one thing we've been doing a bit differently is, you know, instead of the 24-hour refeed, typically it's uh, a 48-hour refeed to so a two-day refeed to a two-day, uh, two days of, of higher carbs. As the athlete gets closer, typically you need uh, a few more days, so three in, in the case of some people, you know, maybe they only spend three days out of the whole week in, in a deficit. So, you know, you expose them to that deficit less and less frequently. And what this tends to do is it gives you a preview of what a peak week will do. You have a few days of loading, and as they get closer to the appropriate shape, you can actually start to gather data from those refeed days. So 24-hour refeeds, we don't do them. Um, I haven't done one. I haven't written up any sort of program in that fashion. And as we get closer to the show and the athlete's leaner, if anything, we pull back how much time we spend in the deficit, right? So what I do is I take the data that I gather, especially towards the end, and we aim for that predictable look. You know, maybe they have three high carb days, and they're like somewhere between day two and day three. That's about how I want to look on stage. It's like the perfect combination of fullness, crispness, um, th that look that, that we, we, we always want, but we seem to miss come stage time. So we tend to try to duplicate that. So we kind of know what to, to expect on the, on the other end. So we do get many trials at the peak week. The, the last four or five weeks, that's essentially what we're doing, is like take that picture of when you feel you look at your best and tell me where you were in regards to your carb intake. Um, how many days were we into our, our high day cycle? Uh, but yeah, we aim for predictable uh, instead of trying to hit home runs. And it, it works out. Um, yeah, I think more often than not, we hit our mark, and then surely we, we get it wrong every, every once in a while. But I think that's why it's in the interest of the competitor to, to do a few shows, and, and you know, with every show, we get closer and closer to actually peaking and getting as close to that 100% as possible. So. I would piggyback off of that and say that, yeah, the last few weeks of prep are really kind of the mock for peak week, in essence. I think that the biggest mistake that people make is they change too much during peak week. 
Uh, and particularly if you're a bikini athlete or maybe even figure, it's obviously not as extreme as maybe a bodybuilder, so that's something to take into account. But the first thing that I would suggest is a few weeks out, start taking pictures, like an excessive amount of pictures, like the day before the refeed, morning of, night of the first one. I do two refeeds usually for my clients also. So morning and night of day one and two refeed, and also then the first morning after the second refeed. Uh, you have to think about prejudging and finals too. So a lot of people, you know, of course prejudging is more important, but if you're going for an overall or something, you have to also look good for finals. So taking pictures in the morning and at night after you've eaten is really important. Uh, and keeping food sources relatively the same or food sources that the athlete digests well or handles well, that's also something important. If you have some like wonky shit on your peak week that you've never eaten before during your prep, I probably wouldn't suggest doing that. Like if, if you've gotten that as a, as a client, I would ask your coach like, hey, why is this on here? Maybe you can switch some things out. But for the most part, I wouldn't say a mock the last few weeks would be about um, a good time to start seeing pictures. You won't really notice if you're not lean, honestly, like the changes from a refeed. You may feel better mentally or get a better pump, but you're not going to see those changes unless you're actually pretty close to stage lean. So the last few weeks, just start doing that is would be my suggestion. I guess I wanted to add one more thing. For, for those of you that have followed me quite a bit, I, I, I tend to be a little bit different than some of the people on the panel in that my, my peak weeks are, I would say, uh, I swing for the fences <laughs> a little bit more often. Um, but one thing, like, I think sometimes when people hear me talk, speak about peaking, they, uh, they think I've like, always done that. And peaking is very much like a, you know, like a lot of things, it's kind of an acquired skill. I don't know about anybody else, but you guys, for those that coach up here, you guys remember uh, the first time you drew up a peak week plan for a client? That was a stressful situation. You're like, because there's not a lot of good information. Because, like you said, you know, what's the peak week approach? I have I have five clients competing today, and the peaking approach is drastically different for all five of them. Some of them were one, one was front loaded, another one did what I call a mid load, where you hit their highest point during the middle of the week. One was a rapid back load, one was a more subtle back load. Two of them I brought sodium up, three of them I brought sodium down, and then three of them I brought potassium up, the two other ones I brought potassium down. So, yeah, I mean, it is literally, it's chaos, and because different people look better with different things. And so, um, the, the more you do it, the better you're gonna get at it. It's just you, you notice trends, you know, I, and I don't know about you guys, but I can even see now a certain body type that will probably respond best to this sodium adjustment or that sodium adjustment or more carbs or less carbs. And uh, like they said, practice is gonna be the biggest thing. So being ready early, if you can be ready even three, four weeks early to get a practice peak week, you're gonna learn something every time you peak about yourself or about peaking in general. Um, and so I would even say be bold in practice but be conservative on game day, if that makes sense. Because you will learn things, like, like John said, he used to do those 2,000 card refeeds, and while he didn't think it was the best, he learned something from those. And so a lot of times, by being a little bold in practice, you can learn a lot about things you can use on game day, but then be more um, <coughs> conservative in your approach. So while I can't give you a layout, I can say practice, 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 will make everything. Yeah, I was gonna kind of point those few things out that Cliff was just saying. One is, you know, be ready early and um, <coughs> try to try to practice it. Um, I do that with myself, um, but again, when I diet, I like extreme lows in carbs and extreme highs, so I'll have 700, 800 carb refeeds towards the end of my diet, and that just works well for me, so I'm taking tons of data for myself <coughs> there um, on how am I looking dry the next morning? Do I need another day to dry out? Um, for myself, usually, I look the best the next morning. Um, so clients are gonna be a lot different, but you can still take that data with yourself. If you're having refeeds in, you can see, do I look the best the next day? Do I look the best two days? Um, I took in 250, was I full, was I still flat, did I spill? Um, and then how I went through uh, with the glucometer. I, I have two clients in shows today, one's a pro, one's doing uh, the Pittsburgh amateur. And um, she's only 20 and she did text me that she was moved to the middle. So and both of them had slightly different um, uh, peak weeks in that the guy needed two days to load and she only needed about 260 carbs. Um, but I went over my, you know, with the glucometer and how I kind of monitor things and get more feedback from my coach, uh, from my clients. But I will tell you this, I didn't play with their water much. Uh, it was kept high pretty much throughout. 
Um, I cut it off at 9 p.m. to sips, but um, they, were, they were on high water. I didn't touch their sodium. So mainly what I was doing was manipulating their carbohydrates, and I was using the data that I got during the diet to kind of figure that out. And I got the biofeedback from my male client um, by doing his refeeds and realizing that he needed more than we could really get in him in a day's time. So we did about 800 the first day and then another three or 400 before he got on stage, and that was pretty good for him. So really you're collecting biofeedback and you're applying it. I think if you're prepping yourself, really the best way is to keep your water steady, keep your salt fairly steady, and use the carbohydrates really to manipulate. And you should be able to get a lot of biofeedback from your refeeds on how many you're gonna need. And, and do I do it Thursday and take two dry off days? Do I do it Friday because I look the best the next morning? So that's really what you should be looking at. And you know, when you start playing too much with the water and too much with the sodium, it, it just gets really tricky because when you flatten, it's like, well, do I need more water? Do I need more sodium? And it just gets really tricky. If you only control one variable, carbohydrates, it's very easy. And then, like I said, if you take it one step further, and like the glucometer I showed you, you should know. If, it's, if my blood glucose is high, oh God, I, I'm not gonna push carbs, I'll go to a protein fastest meal. Oh, I'm back to baseline, it's a protein carb meal. And you can control yourself that way and really kinda land the plane. You know, like for an analogy, I don't know if any of you have seen like uh, the Sullenberger video on YouTube where he's trying to, trying to land. It's pretty dramatic if you've ever seen it. You know, he landed in the Hudson. And I, you know, obviously he would have preferred to land in LaGuardia and that would be like peak week panacea, you know. But he, <laughs> he ended up in the Hudson, you know, he landed it and everyone lived and you know, that'd be considered a win. So sometimes with peak week, you're kind of in that middle. You're not gonna be as full. Um, if, you, if you push a little too far, you're, you're, you might actually make yourself worse. So sometimes you go for that middle ground where you've got enough fullness and enough lines and, and go there. So that's kind of what I would say. <clears throat> I, I really don't have much to add to that. I mean, <clears throat> I like to tell stories. So let me tell you a story. In uh, 2002, I did, uh, no, 2004, I did the Mr. North America, and I was taught in the 80s and 90s that you had to take diuretics and that you had to cut water at a certain time. That's what we were all, you had to do that, right? So in 2004, I was getting ready for North American, and I thought, man, I, I, I think I'm ready. I look pretty good. So my uh, coach at the time, he comes up to the hotel room, and he says, uh, he just looks at me like with this blank look on his face. And he says, let me see your diuretics. So I pull out my diazide and all this stuff. He's like, let me see them. So I handed them to him. He walked in the bathroom, he dropped them in the toilet, and he flushed it. I was like, you mother. Um, he's like, John, you look fine. You look really good. This is the best you've ever looked. I don't want you to mess it up. So I trusted him. I said, all right, man, this is scary as shit because I've been competing a long time. I've never done it without diuretics. I did really well that show, surprised everybody. Um, it turned out really well. My point in telling you that is, a lot of times we hear all these things and we think, you have to do this, this is what everybody does. But that's not true. The principle of individuality rules in this sport. And what you're doing on peak week should be guided by what you've noticed with your client the previous 10 weeks, 11 weeks, 16 weeks. It's not a magic formula that you pull out your butt. You know, you, you, will know, you will know how a person reacts to a little extra carbs. And I like to manipulate carbs myself, but it's very subtle. Um, but just be in shape two weeks out. Don't go crazy, don't do anything drastic. Most people look better before and after the show. There's a reason for that, it's because they changed too, too much. And uh, I mean, that's it, that's how I, that's how I do it. There, there's one thing that I want to add. First of all, Andy brought up a good point where I'm sitting here. You know, a lot of people try and do this magic shit the last half of peak week to, like, try and change everything. Most of the time, they're, they're not in shape, which we all, you know, we all know that, but it's a great reminder. Here's kind of a, this isn't an absolute, but this is one thing. A lot of my peak weeks, I don't get too fancy on. Um, I do, the leaner my clients are, the more I can play with things, the more I can carve them up. And here's kind of a general rule of thumb that, that you can apply, there's always outliers. The leaner you are, especially like male bodybuilders, the closer to the show that you can carb load. If you're a female bikini competitor, you don't need to load on 600 carbs on Friday. And I think we all kind of understand that, but females aren't typically going to be as lean as males. So most of the time, males, if you're in shape, you can load a little closer to the show. Most females, most, 
unless they're bodybuilders, you can load midweek, maybe even do a front load on Tuesday. And I do a lot of test runs, but it's one of those things to where you have to kind of keep that in mind because how many ladies are in here? Raise your hand real quick. Let's see how many ladies. Yeah, so, yeah, so half, you know, half the room. It's one of those things where you really, you don't need to go crazy. You don't need to load super, super hard unless you're a, a very, very lean women's physique athlete, really lean figure competitor, or women's bodybuilder. Okay, and most of the time, figure competitors, you're not going to be so shredded that you need to just load the hell out of carbs on a Thursday or Friday. And that's just kind of a general rule of thumb that doesn't stick. Um, and that's just something to just kind of keep in mind. So, good long answer and question, but we're going to go ahead and, and take another one. All right, so um, for, for most of us here being competitors and, and or coaches, you know, we've all seen or have had clients that are you know, easy to, easy to coach, easy to diet down, and we, you know, we, we see that posted on social media and things like that, and it, it seems like a walk in the park, but, you know, you also hear about, you know, people who struggle, you know, clients that are hard to get into condition, and I'm just wondering if uh, any of you can share any experiences where you either encountered a client or a situation that was extremely, like, troublesome in the beginning of the prep or at the end of the prep, what, how did you troubleshoot it? What are the things that you look for? And what are the things that you may have had to you know, go to extremes to do to get them in shape for the show while keeping them healthy and maintaining you know, physical, mental health, everything intact and be successful in the end? If you can share some stories and, and provide some guidance for the rest of us. Well, when you take someone's money, you're committed to seeing it through till the end with them. So you, you got to work I mean, if, you, if somebody is struggling, if I have somebody competing, like, for example, the last 10 days, they're doing a check-in every single day. If I think they're struggling, it might be twice a day. But it's a case-by-case -case scenario. But when you take someone's money, when you are coaching them, you stick with them until the end. You don't give up. You never give up. Um, if somebody just won't listen, then my personal my what I do is that I don't work with them anymore because what's the point in hiring me if you're not going to listen? But when somebody's listening and they're just struggling, this is where I was telling John, obviously I coach IFDB guys, and I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and tell you they're natural. But here's why I respect John and Cliff so much. They coach a lot of natural athletes. And as a, not, as a, as a coach that coaches natural athletes, you have to think. You have to troubleshoot. You can't just throw drugs at people. You have to really think. That's why I would put Cliff and John up there with any coach in the world because they know how to think. And when you have clients that have really tough issues, you have to think. You, I mean, the answer could be different for everybody. You know, I've had people like, i give you an example, Ken Jackson, who's a really big, strong guy. This guy had to come down to the almost non-existent carbs to get lean. And I've had other people, I mean... You know, I worked with Sean Clarita two years ago when he won the Vancouver Pro. He eats more than I do, you know. And then Fawad won two shows. I was coaching him, and he's eating 2,400 calories. Fawad competes at 260 pounds. Everybody's different, and you know. I've had girls that ate I'm probably more than me. But everybody's different. Don't give up on someone. Fight with them until the end. But think. There is, I wish I could give you, like, a perfect answer, but you just, you know, you just... Stay with them. I've been racking my brain sitting here to try to, you know, give you a good story of someone who's been real difficult. But, you know, you and I have talked a lot, and I usually get athletes who are willing to do what I ask them to do. So, you know, I don't have any crazy stories to give you. Um, a lot of the advice I was, I was thinking in my head is kind of what John said. You know, I mean, you got to stay committed, and you got to keep trying, try things. Um, you know, I think the worst thing you can do is do nothing. You know, I mean, if someone's, you know, if you think their rate of loss is a pound and a half and all of a sudden for the last three or four weeks, you know, it, it's just not coming, you, you better come up with a solution, whether that's breaking some of your rules and doing, you know, uh, fasted hit cardio, um, which I have no problem doing if I need to, but I don't do it unless it's a, it's a really odd situation. Um, I have a few girls that are doing double, they're doing fasted hit cardio and they're doing uh, five to six, seven intervals. Uh, in the evening. It's odd and I don't always do it, but you know, you do what you gotta do and you gotta troubleshoot like like John said. So if it's if it's if it's not a case of them being just, you know, onerous to you and not wanting to follow direction, 
then you've got to work with them, take as much biofeedback as you can get from them, what's going on in their life. Like I told you that, I told the story of that one girl who lost her job, you know, so I knew there was a lot of stress going on and things like that. And we worked it out and finally she just didn't want to keep trying things to get her body to, to, to resolve it. And um, I was fine with that, but we were trying many different things. So I think you gotta open up your toolbox, you know? You gotta know how to do keto. You gotta know how to do, you know, diets where you've got um, no carbs, no fat. How, how do you protect their metabolism? Um, you know, you guys learn when there's sometimes that towards the end, I do things that don't make sense. I've been dropping their carbs, dropping their carbs. I'll lower the fat or the protein very low. I'll up their carbs and bring their fats very low. It might only be for three weeks or two weeks, but a lot of people, they freak out. They're like, well, if 80 carbs didn't work, why are you up in my carbs to 130? And I'm like, well, I'm bringing your protein down. We're gonna try it. Maybe it's too much protein. Maybe your system just isn't doing well and you'll get a nice spike in your thyroid. It, it, it works sometimes, but it's counterintuitive of what you think you would really want to do in that case. So you gotta kinda of sometimes think out of the box. And every move I make, I don't always know if it's gonna work. And if it doesn't, I try something else, but you work through it with them um, and, and stick by them, like John said. So to be slightly different than that, which I completely agree with both of those statements, two things. One, I think the biggest problem is people lock into a specific show rather than a specific physique. And they are trying to get ready for a certain date when really they should be be trying to achieve a certain body fat level or a certain look, right? So I would say for clients that maybe either you worked with them before and you know they have more stubborn metabolism, I would say don't lock into a show, lock into, okay, maybe around these months and just kind of take it as it comes because there are plenty of shows nowadays, um, you know, especially in the MPC, like it's a show every weekend. So even if you have to travel, I wouldn't say lock into a show completely and I feel like too many people do that and they try to rush it when they're not ready and they're doing all these drastic things just to be ready for some arbitrary show. When in reality, you can just push that show back. Um, two, I don't think people take enough time in the off season to build up their calories or to just simply take time off from dieting. So that can cause a lot of problems. If you've had a female who's been yo-yo dieting for five plus years, which is very, very common, don't expect them to just drop weight and get magically shredded and win the Olympia. It's not gonna happen. So you have to be A, creative, like everyone said, B, stick through it, but also make sure you're taking the appropriate time in the off season to actually you know, build up their capacity and just take time simply off of dieting. So those two things I think would be my biggest contribution. Okay, so one thing that all these uh, stories kind of had in common is that athlete buying is, is super important. And like I can go back to just a few things that I did as a younger competitor that made absolutely no sense, or there was quite a few flaws with, with those principles looking back, but I did quite well because I was so like, this is, this is a way, like I, I trusted that process. Um, and, and when you said story, the first thing I thought of was a young man that I worked with about two years ago who, um, I think he was, first of all, he needed to see Cliff's presentation today because I think he was kind of misguided as to why he wanted to do this. Um, and I think one of his main influences, he's like, dude, I saw you on stage, like, in person at some point. He's like, dude, you had, like, glute veins from, like, the nosebleeds. Like, let's do this. Like, you know how to get there. And uh, so we, we start working together, and he's just like, so, like, when do we do it? When do we do it? Like, when do we, like, you know, go hard? When do we, like, just, like, really, really bring it? And I'm like, like what I'm asking you to do, that's, 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 that's what I want. And we just do this for, like, a very long time. And, and you'll get there. And sometimes he would try to do more. You know, he completely abandoned my program because it wasn't like hard enough. Um, he uh, he would like lower food sometimes, pass to way lower than I wanted the food to be, and then he like would goof up on the weekend. And we just did this for about like two months. And, and then finally, you know, like he's like, "What can we do? What can we change?" And I'm like, "Dude, like I, I can't throw anything at you because like you're really just not following along with." what I feel is, is going to work. Um, finally, at some point, he gets it, and we start to progress. And, and, and like, that, was, that, was, that was like our aha moment. He was like, okay, so like, wow, so like, I get what you do. It's, like, it's not like you go 100% every single day. It's like the way you, you finish that marathon is like, you, you, you just cruise at 90, and that's how, that's how you like, guarantee that you get there. Um, and that's exactly right. I think that that's um, that's one thing that not just when it comes to like a contest prep, but I think just hard cases in regards to like a whole competitor's career is like 
it's, it's something that I see way too frequently where, um, especially I'm, a lot of you guys out here, like we're all kind of prone to doing too much. We're a little different compared to like most people. Uh, like chances are we tend to go a little bit harder than, than we should at times and like not look at the big picture, you know? Um, so I, I, when I think of a lot of my hard, uh, yeah, my hard cases that I've worked with, they usually revolve around that, is like being able to take a step back, be patient, and like just like really like, like buy into that process. So again, athlete buy-in is super important, and I think if you get that from your athlete, um, you tend to go much, much further for much, much longer, like past that contest prep, which is super important. So mine's gonna be a little bit different. I'm gonna keep it kind of short and sweet. So one of the hardest things besides trying to diet down someone that's in a really tough spot, as a coach out there, one of the hardest things that you'll ever have to do is explain to them that they're not going to make it. And a lot of coaches have a hard time telling their client, listen, because they feel like it's, like you, as a coach, you feel like it's your fault. And a lot of people can't look in the mirror and they can't be real with themselves. It's really hard to communicate that with your client. And when they pay you money, that to me is part of your job. And you've gotta be real. Because at the end of the day, they're gonna be a little upset that they need to move their, their show or if they can't get lean enough and you can see the warning signs that they need to go off season, but they really want to do that fucking show, you have to be real with them. And they're pissed at first, but most of the time you earn the respect right off the bat. And that's huge. That to me is more important than a damn show because how many people know what show I did in 2010? Nobody knows shit, right? I would have stressed out 2010. I'm going to miss that show. Nobody would know that I was a bodybuilder. Nobody knows what the fuck I did. You need to remember that when you're talking to your clients. And then the other one, and this one's really, really hard because we're not all just gonna get genetically elite athletes every time somebody wants to come to you to prep, all right? So we're gonna have to work with some really tough situations. Bodybuilding, Jason was on our podcast. He brought up a great point. There's bodybuilding and there's competitive bodybuilding. Some people just aren't cut out for bodybuilding at all. There's a lot of ladies out there that have a really slow metabolism that have yo-yo dieted for years that have 50, 60 pounds to lose and they're in a bad place. And if you take them on because you need the money, but you know you're probably not gonna get them there, that's not good for you long term, and it's not good for them. So that's, that's the way I kinda wanna approach it, not from a, a physical standpoint, but how you need to communicate with your clients. Uh, I mean, first off, I definitely have to echo what everyone else has said up here in terms of uh, don't be afraid to pick a new show if you see somebody's not gonna be ready. And a lot of, everyone up here is echoing that. Um, I don't know if anybody said it, but a lot of times, a lot of times when somebody's just not losing weight like you expect to, they are either knowingly or unknowingly eating more than they should. It's just the way it goes. Uh, extra calories find a way of sneaking their way into, into someone's diet. Licking the spoon, you know, an extra ounce here or there, you know, this, I'm eating 50 Tic Tacs a day that aren't getting logged. I mean, it, so if you see somebody that's not, just not losing weight, you get that hunch. You know, as a coach, you, you've all had that hunch, like, what the hell is going on here? This should be moving. Um, so this is where communication comes in. You have to let your client know, first off, that, you know, if anything's out of the ordinary, you don't come out and just say, hey, you're eating more, you bastard, tell me about it. No, no, but like, you gotta like, let them know, you know, if there's extra, you know, it's cool, let me know. Um, if, if you're positive that they're not, you know, not giving you the whole story, then you need to tell them to start, okay, really look at it. Are you logging your cooking spray? You know, like let them know how important it is to log everything. Don't lick that spoon after you measure your peanut butter. Um, and you'd be surprised even just like stressing the importance of those tiny little things. All of a sudden things start cleaning up a little bit. So if you cover all those bases, all right, um, they're not... You know, they're giving you the full story. They're not letting those extra calories sink in there. There are a few people who they're just, you know, s slow, slow metabolism. Uh, like John said, females, more often than not, um, people that are a little bit older are going to maybe have this problem. And uh, <laughs> I, I say this all the time, but also um, more often than not, African Americans are not going to lose fat as easily as white people <laughs> and so uh, you know and, and I think the biggest thing is um, you know sometimes you got to think outside the box in terms of 
what the person is giving you in terms of feedback. And sometimes people can get really down. No matter what I do, I can't seem to lose fat. And it's like, well, you need to just explain it to them. Hey, metabolically, you may have drawn the, drawn the short stick. And you need to have an honest talk with them about if you want to get show lean, we might have to go to more extremes than other people are, are going to have to. And then you need to be um, gauge their willingness to go there. Uh, I had, a, like John mentioned, I had a client that won um, world, the world championships, the natural world championships in 2015. She was a nearly 50 year old, 103 pound uh, female, which means very low calories. I mean, that's, that's, that's a situation there. And she's always had a slow metabolism. And you combine her age um, with, with all of that and her very light body weight. And so, you know, I just told her, I said, you know, if we're going to get you into crazy conditioning, we're going to have to go there. And like John said, we went sub 1,000 calories and, you know, we had great communication. I just said, if you feel like you're hitting a breaking point, you need to tell me. You know, if you feel like you're going to, you know, just snap from this low calories, higher cardio, you need to tell me. And so, but the good news is, I mean, ultimately, you can, if you, if you bring calories low enough and it doesn't, don't take... Please don't misconstrue this by saying just crash diet people. But the truth of the matter is, if calories get low enough and cardio gets high enough, weight loss must occur. It must. If it doesn't, then you're the first person in the history of the world that is not capable of starving to death. You have to lose weight at a certain point. And so, um, you know, assure your client of that. If we keep slowly bringing things down, the weight must move eventually. It's just a whether or not, like I talked about in, in my presentation, <laughs> these extremes you might have to go to, is it worth it for the end result? And then you need to gauge their reaction to that. Gary, you got another question? So whoever wants to touch on it, along with setting up uh, macro goals, do you also set up a fiber goal? If so, how do you recommend setting up fiber? And how does that change when um, setting up someone on a ketogenic diet and also, how do you, do you manipulate that during peak week? Chad, actually, you mentioned something on the, on the podcast about determining fiber totals, how it's different. So if you're good with talking about that, you know, with the, the whole amount of, you know, fiber per day for female and male, and like, based on calories. So maybe that's a good start, and we can talk about keto. Sure. I can try to get us started. Um, so, I mean, fiber intake in general is, is, is one of those things that a lot of people struggle with overall. Um, I mean, collectively, just, I mean, outside of the physique world, um, I mean, lifestyle clients and so forth, I mean, typically do not get enough fiber. It works um, quite effectively to help from, I mean, from some health perspectives, but I mean, primarily to just to help manage and um, attenuate appetite overall. So. Um, I mean, you know, daily fiber guidelines, I think, are, you know, 30 to 35 um, grams or so a day. I mean, most people typically get about half of that. Um, you know, now it, it, it gets a little bit tricky as we start looking at, at different types of carbohydrates and different types of fibers and, and everything else. And I think that's where the overall art form of what these experts to the left of me do. Um, you know, so, but I mean, beyond that, um, you know, there's... A, there's, I mean, a number of different roles for, for fiber. Um, you know, you did, you did mention uh, on the ketogenic side, I mean, that I think becomes a significant challenge. Um, and I, I'll, I'll leave it with that for the, these folks and then maybe talk about how, how you go about kind of managing those situations. Uh, so with keto and fiber intake, um, I usually let my athletes still do about four cups of veggies a day, uh, maybe even more. Um, and then um, I have this uh, psyllium husk. Uh, not always metamucil. There's some things in it that um, actually kind of makes your body more reliant on metamucil itself. Um, so I normally just get like generic psyllium husk um, and have them at that. So normally it would be like two teaspoons uh, morning, two teaspoons midday, two teaspoons at night. And then see how they're doing. Are they regular or not? And if they're not, then let's bump it. Let's bump it more. Um, but you know, I find if you go too aggressive on fiber, then you have stomach issues too, cramping, um, things of that nature. So, round there, most people are okay with the recommendation I just 
gave you. If they're not, um, you discuss it with your client and then uh, start up in the psyllium husk and, and maybe more veggies. Uh, I think if you're running a true uh, ketogenic diet, a couple more uh, cups of vegetables should not keep you out of ketosis. So you could up them there. I'm not that worried about it. Anyone else? Well, uh, you asked about peak week, right? So the one thing that I talked about not really changing too much for peak week, but the one thing, if you are eating a lot of like cruciferous vegetables or like beans or things that really like ferment in your gut, I would probably stay away from them. You're most likely already hungry, so you're just gonna have to kind of suck it up. And I stick to really low fiber vegetable sources. Uh, peak week, usually like spinach, tomatoes, kind of like my go-tos, some asparagus. And then I pretty much keep everything else relatively simple and low fiber, uh, potatoes and some toast maybe. But like that's kind of, I keep it really simple because you don't want anything fermenting, of course, in your stomach, and you want all of that. I think about a week would be fine to kind of cut any of that out. Um, some people freak out about like artificial sweeteners and things like that. Anything that bloats you, you know, I obviously would stay away from. So fiber can bloat a lot of people, so I would kind of just tone it down the last week, but I think a week is pretty sufficient. Yeah, I, th I think we're good. I'm gonna go to the next question. So, I've got the microphone. <laughs> So this is really for John. Uh, you and I were talking about this a little bit yesterday, but anyone can really answer this question. So I recently uh, hired an online coach for about a 16-week stint and learned pretty quickly within the first week that she's not the best coach, despite some research. And so John and I were talking yesterday about, um, you know, it's already been about four weeks, so I'm thinking about doing a show in July, nothing really, really competitive, but just something that I wanted to try, and now I've already lost four weeks and she's been providing very, very poor information. I've been coaching myself. So my question for you is, what tips do you have? Because I still want to respect her. I don't want to just run to another coach. But on the flip side, you know, what tips do you have or what, what do you suggest someone would do in this situation if they're in a situation where you really do want to do the work, but you've got a coach that's not the best? So you talked about this yesterday, and I told you to ask this today because I didn't want to answer it because there's a lot of us up here and honestly, you're probably one of the best people to answer this because it's business related. So I'll start it off and I know it's going to kind of make some light bulbs go off in all of our heads. But listen, if you just hired a coach, okay, you said 16 weeks and you're four weeks in and she's just not doing anything worth a shit. You told me she was sending you like mass emails, all her clients, like cookie cutter diets. Here's the thing, all right? And I'm going to go ahead and put you on the spot. But you had mentioned that you wanted to go ahead and finish up with her because you paid for it, this and that. Listen, first of all, you're gonna waste your time and she's not gonna learn a valuable lesson. Even though you're upset with the way that, that she's prepping you and doing that as a business person, she might learn from her failure. If you get a hold of her and say, listen, this is shit and I'm not happy, legitimately be like, I'm not happy. If a client does that to me and I've had it happen, you know what I mean? Back when I first started and, and I just didn't know, I thought I was doing things right. I learned from it right away and I was glad they actually got a hold of me. So if I were you, don't beat around the bush. Go tell her, be like, this shit sucks, and be up front. Because we all have this, where we have people come apply with us. They're like, I'm not happy with my coach. What should I do? So my last tip, uh, it was like 2011. Lane Norton and I were prepping the same guy, and we didn't even know it oh at the God. same time. Remember my presentation, 2,000 carbs a week. You get to do all this bullshit, right? He hired me to feed his ass 2,000 carbs a week, and he hired Lane to do the other days. And we're both trying to do all this shit together, and we had no idea until he accidentally sent Lane's email to me instead. So I got a hold of Lane, and we talked about it. So here, here's the thing. When someone comes to you and they say, listen, I, want, I have a coach, I wanna use you. The number one thing I always make them do is cancel with that coach and send me the email as proof, because you never, ever know other coaches, they'll go fucking psycho. Like, if they find out that, that you're prepping their client, whether they're doing a bad job or not, you know how it is around here in St. Louis. Like, they'll go psycho, and they'll, you know, they'll do all kinds of shit. You have to cover your tracks, and you need to be up front with them. That's, that's my two things. All right, I'll jump in on this. <laughs> By the way, I apologize for my texting. I literally have clients hitting the stage right now, so <laughs> I'm texting them as we're going. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just gonna echo what John said. Just just be upfront and honest, um, because uh, you know if you aren't honest and you kind of just go through it half-heartedly, um, 
it kind of ends up leaving room for you to end up being the bad guy. You know what I mean? Uh, because you, th there's a lot of interpretation for what the situation is. She can go about and saying you weren't a good client and yada yada yada. But if you're just up front and you just tell her how it is, then there's no misinterpretation. It was put out there what the situation was. You weren't happy, whatever, and uh, you can both move on knowing exactly what it was. And uh, you know that way there won't be uh, people talking about you behind your back because you know how it goes with all that. There's a lot of drama, especially with a lot of coaching teams and whatnot. So just be honest, tell her how it is, and you can move forward with your life. I would just say for everyone listening, this obviously doesn't apply because you've already signed up, but kind of as a red flag, if you're looking for a coach or you know someone who's looking for a coach, if they do not ask you a lot of information up front, that is usually not a good sign. Um, and all of you here probably know that, but just as a reminder, and if anyone is asking you, like I get that question all the time, what should I look for in a coach? Well, the coach should ask you questions, whether it's the application or on their website, whatever it is, they should ask you questions, and then they should look it over and give you an honest answer. When people come to me and say, X, Y, Z, I'm eating 1,500 calories, and I have a show in eight weeks, sorry, I'm not going to prep you for the show. Um, you know, best of luck. Or if you want to work on building your metabolic capacity, we can do that, and then we can eventually do a show later down the road. If you're, don't just jump into anything um, and make sure that the person actually knows what your goals are, and you guys have communicated that very effectively kind of beforehand. So just as a red flag to other people, if a coach doesn't ask a lot of questions, they're just like, yeah, totally ready for this, for the show, just hop on board, uh, here's your your plan the next day, you know, five hours later, probably not a good person to sign up with. Yeah, we, we can, we've got time for a couple more, a couple more questions. Who's, who's next? Um, John, you were talking about your failures and how you learn from them, but how do you, how do you all have the conversations with your clients whenever you are learning from your failures? Whenever you're say, say that again, sorry, speak, speak um, a little closer. Whenever you're learning from your failures, how are you having these conversations with your clients? Are you, you know, I mean, you want to be upfront with them and you want to be honest and, you know, try to save a relationship with them of some sort, obviously, but you're also... You know, you said that, you know, they are your laboratory. So how do you have those, those conversations, I guess? So how, how do you have a conversation when your client, with, with a client that's hired you and you failed? Yeah. How do you have that conversation with them? That's one of the hardest things that people can't do because you have to admit that you fucked up. To me, I do it right there on the spot. I get it done and they respect it. It's that simple. You literally have to make yourself uncomfortable and they will respect it. If you beat around the bush, people smell bullshit right out of the gate. And I, listen, I've spilled people, and I've literally walked up to them at the show, and I'm like, Dude, uh, Lee Larson, 250-pound guy. I don't prep a lot of big guys. We did really, really well, and I just went a little too hard on Friday. And he spilled. He didn't place top five. And that guy prepped for 25 fucking weeks, spent a shit ton of money, and I messed up his peak. And I felt like shit. But you know what I would have felt worse about? Trying to blame it on some other bullshit. Oh, the just the judging's all fucked, you got fucked and all this. If you go right up to him and you legitimately look him in the face or your client or you, you send him an email and go, you know what, I'm sorry, I messed up. I'd love for you to trust me, I wanna learn from this. I, maybe this way will work better next time. Here's the other thing, I've messed up before so bad and, and not with just peaking people, but I had a client that I was miscommunicating with because I had two clients at the same time that had damn near the same name and I kept sending the wrong fucking diet. And this, they were two brats, all right? One would eat 5,000 calories, and the other one was a fatty like me, and he could only eat 2,000. And I kept sending the 5,000 calorie diet to the fatty. And he's like, dude, this is awesome. I'm gaining weight, like I don't know what's going on. <laughs> you know what I did after that went on for a long time? I told him I was sorry, I gave him his money back, he's one of my best friends. So you know what, Leslie, I don't even think I've ever told you that. That's my answer. You just be 100% real with them. You'll never go wrong if you do the right thing. That's what he says all the time. Do the right thing. Where's the mic at? How do you manage your time and how much do you do your work during the day? 
I'm I'm like on call all the time. Uh, you know, it's just like I've accepted it as part of my life, so I don't look at it as like working or life balance. It's just my life. So, um, if you listen to the podcast, you listen to episode 107, it's called Win the Day. It has something that I talk about called the power list. And the power list is basically five critical tasks that I have to do every single day. Um, once those five tasks are done, my day is done unless I'm putting out fires for someone else, which is a big part of what I do. But uh, those five things could be done by two o'clock, they could be done by 9 a.m., they could be done by 9 p.m. at night. But that's how I judge my day. Uh, and then everything else in between, you know, has to do with helping my guys, helping my team, helping other people do their jobs effectively. But um, like to say, I just don't look at it like most people, oh, I work eight hours a day or 10 hours a day or 16 hours a day. Uh, I just see it as part of my life. So I don't like count it, if that makes sense. Um, you know, I, like I said yesterday, I think people get caught up thinking about balance as such a rigid thing. They look at it as like, I've got to work from this hour to this hour, then I've got to go do this and this and this in order to be a good person. And I think it's more important about finding what routine works for you. You know, a lot of people, are, well, especially on the internet, these entrepreneur dudes are like, you got to be up at fucking 4.30. Motherfucker, I don't get up till like 10. You know what I'm saying? I just don't, because that's my natural sleep cycle. And, uh, but between the hours of when I'm awake, I guarantee you I get a lot more shit done than most people. So I think it's about important to find what works for you and just and, and just let that work. There's no set rules, you know what I mean? So, that's what I would say. Thanks. Um, so this is one in a little bit of a different direction, but this is actually a question for Chad, so I'm a bit of a science nerd. So, I just wanted to ask, there was um, the bit about the nutrient timing regarding the protein. So, I noticed that a lot of the studies we were citing indicated that everybody was kind of taking the same amount of protein, about 20 to 25 grams of protein, right? So, were there any studies that you found that actually sort of because everybody's, my protein intake for the day is different than his, you know what I mean? So, was there any studies that kind of, I guess, more regulated the, the protein, like, per person, and, and sort of, kind of like what we do with carbs, like certain percentages being before and after, like anything that kind of looked at more of the individual's needs as far as their protein and, like, cycled it before and after, or do you even think that matters? Uh, it, it absolutely does matter. Uh, 0.25 grams to 0.3 grams per kg for body weight. So um, that, that boils down to ballpark 20 to 30 grams for most individuals per dose. So I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the short answer. Um, I have on, like I said, on the protein side. Um, some really good work out of the Canada really kind of suggested that, that, that 20 to 25 gram dose around the, every three to four hours um, across the, I mean, 12 to 14 hours basically promotes the, the, the highest balance of muscle protein synthesis or um, muscle protein balance. So intermediate dosing, 20, 25 grams every three to four hours um, tends, to, tends to work very, very effectively. And like I said, that, that translates into around 0.25 to 0.3 grams per kg. So if you have somebody who's 50 kgs, really, really small, it, 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 it dials back down. We've got um, offensive linemen that are at 330 pounds. They're, they're at 100 140 kgs, it's, it's, it's a little bit more. But do you think that the timing matters as far as like how much, when they're consuming that? Well, I, I, the, again, it goes back to, I mean, um, optimal protein intake across the day, across the 24-hour period, I, I think will continue to operate as the most significant variable. Um, and then, if, I mean, again, yeah, I think as, as the size of the individual goes, you know, if they, if they do need to dose at, at a little bit higher amount, um, you know, or a lower amount, basically per body weight, sure, go for it. You know, I, I don't, um, we didn't really get into protein, like dosing and safety. I mean, if there's anybody out there that's concerned um, that taking in too much protein is, is bad for you, this is pro probably a crowd where this is pretty friendly. I mean, it's, it's anybody who ever says that to you, they, they, they simply do not know what they're talking about. They just, just send them, in, have them email me, and we'll set the record straight. But there's just, they're, they just simply don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, it's just, there's that, it's just, on a different subject, this reminds me of our conversations in like 2008. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
Dude, I got a funny story about how I met him. Now, I'll tell it at the end, but it's, it's pretty good. No, I, I'll tell it at the end. All right, so it seems like an overall theme and why a lot of you guys are the coaches you are today is from trial and error and just learning from mistakes. But on the flip side of that, what do you think is one of the number one things that you did to educate yourself to become a better coach? Well, I, um, I, when I went to start my website, one of the things I thought was, you know, people will just think I'm a meathead and I don't study this stuff, blah, blah, blah. So I did a couple things. Um, people mentioned uh, Joey Antonio, so I joined um, the ISSN. I got my certification there. I went and got um, another certification. I started attending conferences. Uh, that's where I met Jeff Bullock, and I started reading Dolph John Ivey's work, and I mean, all these names, I know all these names because I just made it a point to read their research, read their books, I mean, all these guys, and, they, and I, what I tried to do was I tried to read different perspectives, because, <clears throat> like, if you're a keto person, and all you read is books by Jeff Bullock, hey, that's great, but you're missing... Hey, maybe there's another avenue, you know, if you're anti-nutrient timing, hey, read John Ivey's work. You might, you know, you might find something you like. But, <clears throat> so I try to get different viewpoints. I attended conferences just like this. And um, when I started my website, I asked people if I could interview them. And that was probably, honestly, it was more for me than, <laughs> than anything. I was like, oh, yeah, man, I'm going to learn a lot from this guy. I remember, like, I could tell you, so much I've learned from interviewing people. So you have to seek it out. I, I think you just have to be open to learning. So I've worked with people that are just smarter than me. Um, actually, uh, 2010, after I finished fourth at Junior Nationals, I hired John for a year to help me with training. So now, like, when I'm writing training, like, I use the principles that, you know, a lot of things that he went over, I still use. Um, I don't know if you guys know Shelby Starnes, but... He ran me through a prep. Um, back in the day, there was a guy with Beverly. His name was Jeremiah Forrester. He's out of the industry now, but he did a diet for me, and he was a, t a top six guy in nationals. So I worked with people who were where I wanted to get, um, and I just dropped the ego. I mean, you don't always know everything, and as long as you just don't you know, think you have an ego about it, you're always going to be open to learn. Even just my last prep, um, I had a couple national guys just always checking in on me and, and saying, hey, what, are, what do you think about that? Why don't, why don't you try this? And uh, even coaches suggesting things to me, even as far as just things to do before I get on stage. And I was open to them, and I tried them on myself first before I would do it with a client. Um, so one, I'm, I'm open to use myself as a guinea pig. And two, I've kind of just surrounded myself and worked with guys who are either where I wanted to be or I knew for a fact were just smarter than me. And that doesn't bother me. It, it makes me a better coach. And as long as I think I keep doing that, I'm going to keep moving forward in my coaching career and, and turning out good people on stage. So. Again, to kind of mimic everyone, I think a variety of education is really important. So uh, obviously I talked about like my master's research, but not everyone's going to do that or needs to do that at all. I think higher education is great, but it's not absolutely necessary. So if you are in school, of course you can learn. And if you are in school, what a lot of times you guys will find is that it's not directly of course, talking about physique athletes or bodybuilding. So I found, at least in undergrad and my master's program, advisors that were like into this and could understand my questions, and I would talk to them after class or set up office hours and ask them stuff, and I was that annoying person, and, but it really helped to get their viewpoints. And then outside of that, going to conferences like this, and even stuff that you don't necessarily do. I attend one of the biggest keto conferences. They started it a few years ago. I don't do keto, but I learn every single time I go there. I meet new people, I listen to the speakers, I read a ton of books, research reviews are great. Obviously social media can be very conflicting, but you can learn a lot too. Um, and what Jason said was awesome. You have to try on yourself first. You don't have to, but I would recommend it if you can, um, at least so that you have empathy towards what's going on. Um, and it's not necessary, but it can help a lot. So a variety of education I think is very, very important and you should never stop. Let's see, so um, I think learning from other people's mistakes, especially like within this industry. Um, I was talking to 
um, a few folks earlier about how this industry just tends to, to recycle people. Like if you go back 10 years, I can give you names that you'd be like, who, really? Uh, this was Mr. Big Shot? So, and part of the reason that they're like no longer here is because they, they just became dinosaurs. They just, they, they got so big, they're like, I'm, I'm done. Like my methods are my methods. These are my philosophies, like that's it. Um, and that's one thing that I, I try to check myself with. Like every single year, I try to have a discussion with myself. Like, what did you? Um, what are you doing this year? What do you? Where were you wrong? Like last year compared to this year. And I try to continually upgrade and, and try to grow with the industry. And I just I strive to not be that that dinosaur. I strive to not be that multiple post that like everyone kind of talks about. It's like pinches his athletes. I need a little bit more peanut butter. You know, don't be that guy. So. Um, yeah, continue learning. It's huge. Uh, for me personally, I, I laugh about this all the time. And I, talk, I, took a, I took a stupid route to where I'm at. Uh, I found this passion after I was already done with school. So I don't have, I didn't have a formal education in exercise science or nutrition. And, um, and uh, like a lot of these, for, I think pretty much everyone here had some sort of mentor or coach, at least at the beginning. I didn't have that either. I, I was so uh, naive to the online bodybuilding community. I was like, what's a forum, you know? And so um, I just kind of felt my own way through it. So what I would do is I was actually getting like Lawrence at a variety of, I would order, um, I, I would get subscriptions to some of the scientific journals that were available online and I would just read them and I had no base of knowledge at all. So I would, every time I would come across a term or an idea that I had no clue what it was, well then I would look that up and it was, it, it took forever. But then I was also reading like the bodybuilding magazines, you know, like Flex and stuff like that. So I was kind of like seeing what the meatheads were doing and then what the scientists were doing and um, kind of putting it together in my own style. While it was a, a hugely inefficient process, um, I do think it helped me in one manner in that I came in with no preconceived notions. I didn't have anybody influencing my ideas at all. I didn't, I didn't really look at what other people's methods were. And um, so it kind of allowed me to even like read studies. And a lot of times what I would usually take away from the studies weren't even the conclusions. When you would read them, it was the tidbits of information that were interesting that you wouldn't expect about the study. Whether it be, um, I would read it and I would say, well, I didn't like this method of the study. It seems like they could have done it better here. And you can kind of take away more practical um, implications from the study than necessarily the conclusion. So I would say, um, you know, when it comes to uh, looking to develop your own methods, try to keep the most open mind you possibly can and try to avoid preconceived notions and you'll learn a lot that way. Mine's really quick. So um, it's definitely okay to look at the people in the industry, the coaches in the industry, they're doing what you want to do and they're getting results. They run a good business. Look at them and follow what they do and then take that and apply it to yourself and your clients. There's absolutely nothing wrong with learning from the different coaches and a lot of people don't want to admit that but a lot of people have done that. So if you don't have the money to hire a coach, you're not interested in that, you can still follow, you know, everyone up here has articles written. You know, we've got the podcasts that are all out. If you want to learn about your business, you've got the business podcast, the training and nutrition truth podcast. You can go to conferences and all that stuff. So that's a good way to just take it and apply it instead of hiring a coach. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. Well, I had something to say too, but Chad actually, and I agree, so I'm just gonna let Chad say what we both think. So this is on behalf of Andy and I. Uh, no, but I, I guess the one thing that I was going to say, because I tried to grab the mic as brisk as soon as the question was asked. So, and this is, because I, I, I've gotten to know Andy and John and Cliff the best out of everybody here. And I can say, so I'm just really kind of speaking more about, about the traits that I've seen with, with, with um, all three of these guys. They're, they're I mean, two things. They're, their mind's open, all right, to failure, uh, to doing well, um, and then more often than not, they 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 check their ego at the door. With I mean, so uh, to basically offer up suggestions, they're absolutely not afraid of failing. And and and, and I think that's so very important. Um, from the self education side, folks, there are there are more free scientific journals out there than there's I mean than there's ever been. You know, so now if you don't if you don't come from that that background and that and that that type of writing is is. 
I guess a little bit more intimidating. That I mean, that's a little bit of a challenge, you know. But 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 I mean, overall, I mean, there's more scientific content that's out there. Um, so I mean, look for it. And then I mean, secondly, if there's if there's somebody who who wrote a paper that you like, I mean, email them. I mean, my every single paper that I've written, my email address is on there. Send me an email. I'll send you the paper. Give me a phone call. I, I don't really I don't care, you know. So I and mean, then there are there I know hundreds of scientists that feel that way. So take that for what it's worth. One thing I'll add real quick because John's too humble to say it, but you've got a great website. John, what's your website? It's mountaindogtraining.com? Mountaindogdiet.com. So there are good websites out there with the top people in the whole industry that charge, and they put out new content, not just from John. You have multiple people that add to that. So just real quick, I wanted to touch on that because, I mean, that's great. That's great information that you can pay for and get. Also, to touch on what you just talked about, um, I asked John this, I think, uh, a couple months ago. Um, I want to get a degree in, like, psychology, but also either, like, nutrition or, like, exercise. But, like, there's degrees out there for, like, kinesiology, exercise physiology, strength and conditioning, or and you have your master's in exercise science. What would you guys recommend for someone who's wanting to get a degree in exercise but actually for it to be useful because there's so many degrees out there but I want it to be useful so well you know I mean that's what I do I mean that's that's that's, that's the world that I live in I mean I teach I teach in the undergraduate exercise science program at Lindenwood teaching the graduate human performance program I've done that at Oklahoma and, and, and um, New Mexico as well I I think overall um, the, the it's critically important that with the, the way that the educational structure is set up in most academic programs at the university setting, we, we teach, we teach a, a broad foundation of the theoretical principles. So it gives you a very good foundation of key information that you run into throughout your day-to-day -day life. But there is absolutely no replacement for getting out there, getting in front of somebody, touching somebody, communicating with somebody. We can't teach you these types of things. I mean, degree programs would take six years, and nobody wants to pay college for six years. You know, so, I, I mean, so I, I, I there's, um, you know, I, I think a big part of your, of your question, um, you can help to answer yourself by, by really clearly defining what your, goal, what your goal is from that education, what you truly want to do with it. Um, I've said this many, many times, and mind you, I'm, in, I'm a physiologist, which means I study the body and how it responds. I, I fundamentally feel like we know really all that we need to know about how the body responds to exercise and nutrition to help improve it from a health perspective and from a physical appearance perspective, but we are just beginning to scratch the surface from a psychological perspective. So, and I, I, I say that many, many times that the longer that I'm in this business, I feel like the best personal trainer has maybe three or four classes in exercise science, so I'm totally killing my own major, and they have like 14 PhDs in behavior modification. <laughs> I, I'm dead serious. I, so, so, but the thing is, is, is it takes experience, it takes failures. The, all these people up here, how many clients have they done well with? How many clients have they d not done well with? You know, so you, you, so at some point, I think, I mean, believe in yourself, um, um, I mean, get an educational base and then just, just get out there and just keep going. So the number one thing to answer your question is you have to find a program that is, of course, 
that does that, an advisor that does that, an advisor that's interested in that. My advisor was interested in physique, sports, and dieting. That's not normal, but I found it. Yeah. And you may have to move, you may have to do a lot of research. Um, if you're in an undergrad program and it's a lot more broad, what I did was I looked at the faculty at Florida State, because I started out dietetics and then I switched, so I didn't really know many of the exercise science professors. When I switched, I started to look at what they were all interested in. And Dr. Michael Ormsby, if anyone knows him, he's an awesome researcher, and he had, a, he had a line of research that I was interested in. So I came to him, I approached him and said, I want to do research under you, help as an undergrad student with the masters. And it's called different stuff at every program, but I helped basically do stuff with the research that the master's level students are doing, and I got to learn under them. And then, so that was very broad, and then I still went out of my way to kind of figure out what I wanted to do. And I learned very quickly what I didn't want to do, because they were doing many things that I didn't want to do. And I was like, okay, I definitely don't want to do that for my research or my application. And then I, for my master's, I went ahead and I found Dr. Kemp. He called me and he said, this is what we're doing, and I was like, this is where I want to go. So you're going to have to do that research on the back end, and there may not be a program yet, but if you find an open-minded advisor and then you're saying, hey, this is what I'm interested in, they might be totally on board like Dr. Campbell was. He didn't come to me and say, let's do a flexible dieting study. I said, hey, would you be on board doing this? And he was super excited. So I know that I was beyond lucky and blessed that he was, but you know, you'd have to kind of take that into consideration too. So. I don't know if that answered, but it, it helps. Becoming a diet coach, you're going to get a PhD in psychology anyway, I promise you that. I guarantee every one of us up here have learned to deal with that. I always joke and tell people, I know we got one more question, I can tell you when every single female client of mine, a bunch of you are looking at me right in the face, when you're going to have your period before you know you will. And I also have to walk you off, back off the ledge to, under, to explain what the scale is and all that. So there's also a lot of in the trenches knowledge with that. It, you really do get to learn people pretty well, and you know it's kind of funny because um, I think one of my weaknesses in the beginning is that I didn't understand people at all. Um, generally, I found that, especially early on in my life, I'd never feel like I related to people really well. And um, like when I would see people doing stuff, not even as a coach, even before, I would see people doing like dumb shit and think to myself, "What are they thinking?" And so then I would just kind of like go along the process of like, why do they do this, you know? And then, and then you, I think often if you, it sounds like you have an analytical mind already. And really a lot of times you can, you can understand people's <laughs> motivations sometimes better than themselves because you're on the outside perspective. And if you just really look at what they're doing and, you know, the way they react to situations, a lot of times you can get an idea of where they're coming from and then start to deduct what they need to hear. But, you know. Lauren, listen to Lauren's response in terms of that, but in terms of practical experience, that's what I would be my suggestion. I will say this too, because this is important for everybody here. The world is changing in the way that we educate ourselves, okay? 20, 30 years ago, you had to go to college. You had to get a PhD. You had to have these credentials to be respected. And the reality of life right now is that that's changing, okay? You can learn more now on your own than you'll ever learn in a formal classroom. You can learn more effective strategies as to what you're doing by studying the specific things that you want to learn on your own without anybody telling you, you know, study this, study that, study this, and become what you want to be. And we've never had that in the history of the world before. It's never happened. So I would be, and what Chad said is know where your destination is. What do you want to be? What are you trying to do? Why do you want the credentials that you're looking for. Why do you need them? Because here's the thing. You're going to walk out of that school with a $100,000 debt. And the credentials that you have from that school are going to pay you fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year. And unless you figure out how to somewhere leverage that, you're never going to pay that off. So I would think long and hard about traditional schooling right now. It's changing. I don't have a degree. Most of the guys I know that are very, very successful are fucking college dropouts. And they, go, they chose to self-educate. They chose good habits over formal education. Reading a book a week for 20 years like I have, okay? You don't have to do it the way society says you have to do it. And we're fortunate enough to live in a situation now where you can educate yourselves far more effectively than anyone else can educate you. And that's never been the case before in history. And I would just, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not saying you shouldn't go to school. I'm just saying it's something to think about because tagging yourself with 100K worth of debt that you're never going to be able to pay, it 
that's not a great way to start out life. This is to the Gen Pop coaches. Um, <clears throat> what is the best advice you have for uh, someone that's trying to gain as much lean muscle mass as possible um, that just started a reverse diet after a lifetime of yo-yo dieting? So, so tell everybody real quick, because you and I are working together. Yes. So yeah. I'm going to skip this one. So give them a real quick scenario. By the way, Brian Lagunas damn near won the whole first form transformation contest. There was a number of people. Leno won it. You were right there in the mix. You know, there's a whole bunch of other people. So how much weight did you lose? Let's paint the picture for these guys so they can answer. Uh, 135. 135 pounds, all right? So I'm going to paint, help paint the picture here because you guys will understand metabolically what was going on. So he lost a lot of fat, a lot of fat. And as we all know, as a natural guy, he's lost a lot of muscle in that process. So where he's at currently, we reverse dieted. He hasn't gained a pound since December, but his calories are all the way up. You're eating 370 carbs a day. That's where he's at. He's wanting to know what tips you guys have to help him put on muscle. Well, <clears throat> I don't know what your training habits are, but um, if you are not... I, I tend to look at things real simplistically. If what you're doing now, training-wise, because I know whatever you're doing diet-wise is working. Um, if you're not, if you don't have the results training-wise, you got to change your training. Um, I mean, I, there is no magic answer, but you have to push yourself. You know, when you sit and you're sitting there training and it starts to hurt, and you go, "Oh, that was a good set." No, you should think, "How in the hell am I going to get another five reps?" Walk out of the gym and say to yourself, I never thought I could do that. I mean, if you really want to make drastic changes, that's what your mindset has to be. It can't just be go to the gym, work out, and go home. You know, remember my doomsday example? Your body will adapt. Um, so that's a quick tidbit. Well, what, what came to my mind, um, did you just start training while the fat loss was going on, or... Uh, I started, July will be two years, okay. but I've dieted the most of my so, life. So, <laughs> what I think is, it's probably, you know, it's just my opinion, I don't know if everyone agree with me, but one of the biggest differences between, like, an intermediate or a beginner trainer and, like, someone who's been doing this a really long time, is, like, when I go in to do a set, from the first rep, I'm getting everything out of the muscle, and it already is hurting and starting to pump up. When I was intermediate, I would just pump along and maybe that 10th or 11th rep would start to hurt. So to get yourself, I wish I would have, someone would have kind of explained it to me and told me that earlier in my bodybuilding career, but I think what really separates the advanced trainers, which I would like to think I am now at this point, but it took me a long time to get there, is that try to focus and make every rep count from the get-go. Everything is a contraction and you feel it, okay? Get yourself a get yourself out of that intermediate stage immediately. Because like, it sounds like your diet, I mean, you're already 375 carbs, so, and John knows what he's doing with diet, so it sounds like you got, you're gonna end up being a surplus, okay? And then you're gonna have to practice patience. I mean, I don't know what your testosterone profile looks like after losing that much. I, I don't know if you guys have had it tested, um, but, you know, that needs to be healthy, so your hormones have to be there. Um, it might not hurt to get your blood work and see where it's at, you know? I've had guys, just from natural supplementation, increase their testosterone uh, 300 points from some uh, really good Bulgarian tribulus and then uh, Doug um, Miller's product, that Cortez. Put those two together, 300 points I've seen go up on my guys that are natural. That's a, that's a pretty significant amount that's going to allow you to recover more. I'm not saying it's going to put slabs on you, but you've got to tilt everything in your favor now because you've already hired a coach and that's going to that's gonna get you going in a much faster direction. So I think Focus on your training, like John said, and then try to get yourself in that mindset where every rep counts immediately. And then I would probably get some blood work right now, is what I would probably do. So they took all my answers. <laughs> but yeah, training age, patience, blood work is huge. A lot of people, and I'm guilty of this too, kind of overlook it. You're like, no, oh, I'm fine. But if you, if you don't get the, the test done, you really don't know where your levels are at. So that's going to be really important patience, training age, and then of course training intensity, um, and try new things, that would be my one thing to add, just try different styles of training, 
maybe one thing, you know, everyone is very different um, while still being similar. You know, you have to have, of course, volume and intensity and, you know, accumulation of things. But maybe try a different type of training style, see how that works for a few months, give it a go, and then, you know, try something else if it's not working. So I think firstly, like what you did um, in regards to the work ethic, like that part that you have down, um, I mean, you, you went way out of your, I, I can't think of a time in my life where I've like stepped that far out of my comfort zone. Even when I went from like just like Jim Meathead to like, I'm, you know, get on that stage. It, I mean, they weren't that far apart. So in terms of the work ethic, it, it's there. Um, you, you obviously had to modify a lot of things in, in your lifestyle in order to, to get to this point. Um, and I would say probably my biggest concern is that you just went through a fat loss phase where the, the, the goal was to watch the scale go in that direction. And, you know, you, you, you obviously did some things to hardwire that, to make that happen. They were very successful and useful to you during this, this extended fat loss phase. But now that you are going to reverse the other way, it's going to take a whole different set of, of habits and goals. And, and the biggest difference between fat gain and, and, and muscle loss is that they happen like very, very, at very different rates. So now you're going to have to invest in going this other direction that almost feels, it feels like wrong, right? It's counterintuitive at this point. And it's a much slower process. And you're going to have to gain weight. Like you're not gonna put on significant amounts of muscle if you're running around. To a certain extent you might, simply because of your training age, you know, you're eating enough now, and just that in itself is, is going to, you know, cause some muscle gain. But if you wanna go past that, you're definitely going to have to get into a point where for a, an extended period of time or a few months, you're going to have to eat a surplus and you're going to have to gain some weight and that might not feel fully comfortable. Um, however, I think one place you can go back to in your head is that, dude, I lost 135 pounds. Like, I know how to do this fat loss thing. Like, I'm, I'm really good at this. Now, you're better at it than me, dude, right? So, Remember that as you embark in that direction, as you gain your first 15, 20 pounds gaining, is it like, I can take these off because I've done far worse than that. So that's probably the biggest thing, is like learning to go in that direction. That's gonna take a while, and you won't be comfortable with it at first, but you have, you have guidance, and that's, that's gonna help you, like, it's gonna help you stay objective when it comes to this next thing, which in its own way is just going to be as, as difficult as the fat loss phase you just encountered. Do you guys have anything to add? So, you know that, like, dude, I struggle with my weight a lot, too. So I, I want to tell you this, like, and John knows this, because I, you know, John and I talk about dieting a lot. But, um, and, and I think this is important for all of you guys who are coaches to think about, is that, you know, <clears throat> people who uh, lose weight tend to think that, it, like, it's really hard. Like, it's really fucking hard. It is hard. And, and, and it's, it's a difficult thing. But I think it's important to note, and, and these guys touched on it, and I, ta I told you this yesterday, that it takes just as much, if not more, discipline to put on muscle. And a lot of people who have lost a lot of weight or who are always like, overweight have a hard time understanding that because they look at dudes who have muscle and they say, like, oh, well, that dude's in great shape. It's easy for him. It's not easy. It takes just as much discipline, just as much planning and work and even more so, and definitely more patience, um, you know, and it's just, it's just going to take time. So, you, you know, realize that, because a lot of dudes who lose a lot of weight, they give up on the muscle, and then they end up getting fat again, because they, they think, well, I just not built to have muscle, and so and then they give up hope, you know what I mean? It's just, it's the same thing, it's just changing the math. So those are all great points, and that's why I wanted you to hear that from everybody else. Chris Valentin, I want you to please raise your hand. I want you guys to get together and list Chris took off. Okay, if not, you need to look up Chris Valentin, a client of mine who's been through everything you've been through. He's had skin removal. He ended up putting a bunch of muscle on. He's won a pro card. He's went that route. Connect with him. Here's the, here's the thing. I look at a lot of this like almost building a business. You talk about being aggressively patient all the time. You need to approach it like it's building a business. I have a, the Fat Muscle Project started. And I want it to be big, but I know damn well it's not, go it's gonna take time. And the last thing I wanna tell you is you need to enjoy this process because here's the thing. You, you got rid of, I don't know, like just think of some old shitty ass beater, like some old Chevette that's rusted out, that's gone. 
Now you've got a nice car. You see what I'm saying? And you're adding a bunch of high performance stuff to that car and you need to enjoy that process because a lot of people stress out and they don't enjoy it. And if you're not enjoying it, it's going to suck. Dude, I'm telling you, you're building a race car right now. Enjoy it and then you're gonna walk around in that motherfucker and you're gonna be like Sal walking into the pool holding beers, beers and your shit's not gonna jiggle. Like that's, you're going to have that. So you have a race car, enjoy that process. Take one more. <coughs> it's a good Q&A, it's gone for two hours. Okay, so um, this is regarding competition prep and post-show nutrition protocols. Um, so whenever I first got into competing, um, all anybody could ever talk about was the metabolic damage and how reverse dieting very slowly and meticulously um, was the way to go where you'd slowly add in food and you'd have the goal of you know staying lean or staying as lean as possible while being able to eat as much as possible. Um, and then Alberto, whenever I first heard about your uh, recovery diet protocol, it was very different from what I had heard. Um, and I was a little bit confused, especially from a female competitor's um, you know, psychological perspective who just spent 25 weeks dieting to get all this, this weight off you know, immediately after you, um, you suggest gaining eight to 10 pounds right after a show. Um, from that perspective, um, you know, the, these women or you know, people in general, they're probably a little bit more sensitive to body dysmorphia or fear of weight regain. I could understand why this protocol seems a little bit extreme and could be a little bit mentally um, challenging to do. I'm just curious as to why you personally um, suggest this protocol over others and what the other competition prep coaches suggest to do after a show. All right, so. I think the answer to this, um, and, and then we'll, we'll supplement it with a few other points, is, is just the fact that the success rate is very low. Like, how often have you heard, you know, this time I'm going to reverse right, because the last four times it just it didn't work out. Um, and I think just, just that in itself is, is like, like, no one pulls this thing off. Like, I, I've yet to see someone go from... Uh, you know, I was, uh, I was dieting uh, on, uh, I guess part of the cell as well was that you're going to sneak food in, you're going to stimulate things metabolically, your, your body fat set point will almost like magically rotate this way, and it just, it doesn't work that way. Like there's, there's, there's really nothing out there, in both in terms of re like actual like research, like you need to reset a few things before certain hormones get back to normal. Uh, I've, and again, you've never seen it in practice. I've never seen someone like remodel everything and, and now they're walking around eating twice as much as they were at the bottom of their contest prep uh, and, and relatively at the same body fat. It just, it, it just doesn't pan out and it's not very practical and it makes people go through a lot of unnecessary pain. Um, so uh, for some people who it has worked, this is kind of what I feel happens. So just to kind of throw some numbers at you guys, let's just say for this person, maintenance, uh, for them generally is 15 calories per pound, 15 calories per pound in, in their off season. That's about maintenance. And in order for them to get into contest shape, to lose fat, they need to be at around 10 calories per pound. A lot of these reverse dieting models, what they do is like, they just tippy toe back up to the 15 calories per pound. We're fixing nothing. You're just making the deficit smaller. I think that's a fine way to taper back into that, into a show and like kind of find that threshold so that Again, you expose that leaner body to a smaller deficit and you fill things out and, and reversing into a show, I think that makes sense. It's kind of like uh, the fatigue model and powerlifting where you know you pull back excess volume and, and things like they come back to life, right? Uh, but it, it, when it comes to coming out of the show, it's like, no, no, first thing we need to do is like get ourselves back to a healthy body fat. And every other sport does it. There's no sport out there when you're in peak physical shape year round. Like when I ran track, spring times, like early spring times were way different than like late spring times. You know, it's like, oh, that's a good, good early season time. You're not running around peaked all year. You just like rip hamstrings. So, um, so yeah, I think it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's something that's unrealistic to reach for. Uh, and because of that, we've switched over to what is now a recovery block. And I think if you tell an athlete, like this is where 
we want you to gain. It might be a little bit more than they're comfortable with, but very similar to his situation. It's because, dude, they just dedicated weeks and weeks and weeks to going in this direction. And now it's like, let's pull back over here so that you can get healthy and start working at it again. I do think that over time, people can bring down their walking around like body fat levels, but these are behavior modifications that are better left for the off season, not after you've you just completed five months of dieting. That makes no sense. Like that's the last thing you want to do. Um, and I think that's one thing that just about everyone here can say is that generally speaking, the longer you do this, the a lot of these habits that might have been overwhelming to you early on, they just become second nature. You know, uh, I my top in off season weight was like 180 this 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 year. Like that's it's never been that lean before, and a lot of that has to do with just changing things up, but this is like in the peak of my bulk, not like two weeks after my show. So, um, yeah, again, it's just unrealistic. It's almost like semi-cruel, and I think you need to get people healthy first, and then we can work on, you know, keeping you leaner year-round. But that's like, say that for another time and place. So, yeah, as you can, yeah, I'm pretty fired up about that. One. So, thank you. I'll just add for the, all the females listening, because I think that this is a huge thing that we all deal with, of course. Um, Walking around in stage condition is not healthy. It should not be, and it should never be the goal. Uh, of course, everyone likes to have you know, their glute tie-in and an ab vein or whatever it may be that you get excited about, but that is not normal. Obviously, if it was normal, you'd walk around like that year-round, right? And there are some people who are just naturally very lean, but for the majority of people, you're kind of in the middle. You, know, you hold muscle, you hold fat, and you're generally going to have to diet to be stage ready. And so, the idea of thinking that you have to be this shredded all the time. And we all know if you've been lean once, everything else feels like huge compared to that. You're like, you gain a few pounds, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't even walk around out of my house. I should just live here and just never move. It's honestly, and we've all been through it, and especially like immediately after a show when your hormones are still trash and you're absolutely crazy. So number one, it's not healthy, nor is it realistic. So it's really important, again, going back to the blood work thing, to make sure that you are getting healthier. Putting body fat back on, is not unhealthy because you're at an unhealthy level to start with. Now, I'm not suggesting to become like morbidly obese and rebound 50 pounds, but it's, you guys know what I'm talking about. So it's, it's really hard to, especially with social media and a lot of the people who compete year round that like that image is like stuck in your mind. Like, oh my gosh, this girl competes all year and she just boasts about taking a week off and this and that. And there are some people like that. But those people don't last. So if you're in this for the long haul and you want to be a healthy functioning person and you want to do more than just walk around and have ab veins, you need to take dedicated off seasons where you are adding in calories. And especially from the get-go. What I do is I add calories right back in. Um, and I've, I've never done a, I've done a successful reverse diet for like two weeks one time. And, and then I, I just kind of, I was like, why am I going to keep, it mentally gets really hard because you're like, why am I such a failure? Like I died all this time. Why can't I just keep pushing? But it, it's just, there's a lot of other underlying issues. So I don't think it should be the goal at all. So I'm going to add something really quick um, because I have more of a different approach than you guys do, but I'm constantly changing it. I'm starting to lean a little more towards a recovery diet side. We're embracing it because when I wrote the first book, Metabolic Passing and Reverse Dieting, mine was that slow, steady process. And it, it, what I thought was right at the time, you and I did a podcast like three years ago. And we kind of thought that's what it was or four years ago. thought that's what, what it was at the time. And I've changed my approach. And here's why. Here's what a lot of people don't understand. When you're talking about your hormones still being in the dirt, when you're very, very lean, here's what happens. I'll explain this really, really quick. You have three hormones that can just be trashed. So when your body fat's really, really low, especially if you're female, your testosterone's in the shitter. If you try and stay too lean and your body fat stays down there, your testosterone's going to stay low, all right? You want to put muscle on, so that's not what you want. It takes a little bit of body fat. The bitch of it all is there's this hormone called leptin, and it helps speed up your metabolism, but it's also a hormone that when you eat, it sends a signal to your brain that tells you that you're full. The leaner you are, leptin is made right here in the fat cell. The leaner you are, the less leptin you have. And it doesn't speed up your metabolism like it should, and it doesn't tell you that you're full. So if you try and stay too lean, you're going to be hungry, and your metabolism is going to be slower, and you're sitting there fighting a never-ending battle. So that's usually only for the genetically elite or the people that can keep a lower body fat set point. So that's something that you have to understand and keep in mind. 
And the other thing is, and, and this is where I want to see more research, and this is where I don't necessarily agree so much, is most people, they've gotten their body fat back up, but to me, to get hormone levels back up, it takes, it's not just your body fat going there in like eight weeks, because I've had a lot of clients send me blood work, and their testosterone and their numbers are still low. So time is important. So kind of what I have is, in Alberta, I've been listening to a lot of your stuff. I'm trying to find a middle ground to where it's slow enough, but we're adding enough and their body fat's going back up maybe, you know, for a female, 10 to 15 pounds in 12 weeks. And they're in that middle ground to where they feel good, their body fat's at a good place, they look good, but they didn't just blow right back up. Because your test, your, your levels aren't going to be back there just because your body fat levels are up, from what I've seen. And I know you wanted to add something to that, right? Yeah, pretty similar. I, I would say I don't go quite as fast on the reverse as, as Alberto and like you guys do with the recovery diet. And for quite some time, I've never really gone super slow. I know you've gone super slow in the past with like, you know, you know 15 carbs here and there. Um, but I, I, I've kind of gone middle of the road, um, I would say, an accelerated pace reverse diet where um, I focus a lot more on performance than body fat. That's, that's my goal. It's like I gauge how people are feeling. And the rate of reverse is just going to vary wildly from person to person. I, I just never do the same things twice. I gauge how they're feeling. If they're feeling like total crap, I push it faster. And then performance, because I do think even before hormones reach a level of homeostasis, you can almost have a certain degree of uh, just muscle growth, even if hormones aren't in an optimal spot. Because if you add 60 carbs to someone's plan, you're not necessarily going to see significant fat increase with 60 carbs, but you'd be surprised 60 carbs added right before training can improve performance quite a bit. So then almost as you go, you are seeing performance increases and therefore you see you know weights go up. So that way I can almost extend. And so rather than adding like 20 carbs every week, I'll add 60 carbs every week, 70 carbs every week. And I just kind of keep working it up like that. And so um, it extends the amount of time which I can have their performance increasing. Uh, because if I put on 10 pounds too quickly, while it gets their body fat back to normal levels, it'll probably increase the, it'll decrease the amount of time until there's going to be a mini cut. So I try to stretch that out. So for me, it's less about the body fat and more about how they're feeling and how they're performing. Um, so then re one real quick thing, and th then what I want, guys, is we're going to all, we're going we're gonna to start down here with you, John, so if you want to start thinking... One thing that you can send to everybody here that's going to bring them value. So just one thing. So start thinking about that. And I'm going to touch one more, one more thing on the reverse dieting. Leonardo. So here's the thing that, that I think everyone needs to understand. Is you have to, if you're a female or a guy, and you get your body fat and it gets up really high, and you, and you lose quite a bit of fat and scale weight to get down, most people are going to lose a lot of muscle that way. So I'm always looking for people that, you know, if you're female and you have to lose 30, 40, 50 pounds, you're going to lose a decent amount of muscle there. So I'm trying to not necessarily get it up too fast. I'm trying to find maybe a little lower set point to where maybe you only have to lose 20 pounds for a prep. Some girls can stay within 15, but you're, you're trying to find that key point. You're trying to, you know, when you feel good and you train. But like Alberto said, you don't want it to be nine months later you put on 15 pounds you know what i mean but some people are good at that 15 pounds like diana you're good like we've got you in a good place so you have to think about where am i going to have to diet from and where am i trying to land and get into a good caloric range because that's why all this shit is an art form like that's why the book i wrote the book but i almost hate that book because it it's so hard to apply like that's why you have a version 2.0 so it's one of those things as coaches it's an art form you have to kind of figure it out as you go so, do you guys have anything else to add about reverse dieting? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with John, and we're just going to go all the way down and think of something that you can send them home with to where they can either better their physique, better their business, better themselves, better their clients, whatever. <clears throat> well, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to say two things. Um, the, the first one was, remember when I talked about your habits have to match your goals and what you think your destiny is? Remember that, remember that every day. The other thing, I really, really loved Cliff's presentation today. And one of the reasons why I love it is because I've been in this industry for a long time. And I can see how 
I can see the good and the bad. I can see how people get so obsessed about the sport and how they look. I can see how it can really have a bad impact on their lives. So here's what I would tell you. Um, this, do not alienate those around you, your friends, your family. It's not worth it. So when you're dieting, um, remember what you're saying. Don't be rude to people. Don't have a short fuse. Do not alienate the people around you. I've seen it. I can't even begin to tell you how many bad relationships and really awful things I've seen over the years. I saw a guy uh, get a divorce from a lady two years ago who was, you know, I don't know all their details, but he basically told me he was mad at her because she wouldn't make all his meals for him. Oh I was like, what in the fuck is wrong with you, dude? Um, <laughs> but it's a really, the sport can chew you up and speak a lot if you let it, so stay humble and remember the people around you that are there for you and love you and never, ever treat them bad, okay? That's the biggest thing I can tell you. Yeah, I think, um, I think I'm going to cheat because I can't really narrow it down either. <clears throat> On the coaching side, um, there's a lot of coaches, right? Like all of you guys, not all of you, but a lot of you want to be coaches. Um, invest in your people like care about their lives um, you know I've got clients that I've helped get jobs um, I have clients that I talk to them about you know just difficult things in their relationships uh, their parents people dying um, uh, I, I didn't say it but I am an attorney I give free advice to my clients all the time if you've got something that you can impart or give to your clients that is going to be different than what other coaches, like, I like all, all these people here are great, but I've got to figure out a way, for some reason people want to come to me, and then you've got to figure that out too, but invest in your people, you're not there just to send a quick email and give them some macros and, and that's it, if that's all you are, there's a lot of people out there that can do that, I think I've been successful because from day one I've cared, when I started out I did this shit for free, um, because I just liked it. Um, and I like to learn people's stories and what makes them tick. So try to do that, find out what makes people tick, and then invest in your clients, and your clients will stay with you. Um, I mean, I've got clients that have been with me for eight, nine years. Um, and then the next one is, you know, I never set out to be a bodybuilder. I mean, I, I, I started lifting because, you know, I probably needed a little more, uh, you know, a little insecure and, and, and for sports, you know? And so, for me, the things around me that were fun always came first. Um, I do like to socialize. I do like to go out sometimes till 2 p.m. to a concert with my wife and drink wine and, you know, be up too late. Is that great for your gains? No. But, I mean, look at me. I'm not going to be a Mr. Olympia. Even on a classic physique stage, I, it might not happen. I'm fine with that. Um, and so don't give up on the things that you enjoy just to chase this crazy physique because at the end of the day we're all going to get old we're all going to have saggy man moves one day and, you know it, 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 it's all going to happen so I love the sport I love looking different than the general public but don't give up on the things that that make you happy I guess is what I'm saying in pursuit of So one thing is, I think all of the speakers here, or we all offer something very different, but we all have a similar message. And I can't tell you how much I've learned from all of these people just this weekend. So what I would suggest to anyone is always be learning from people, even if you don't think maybe you could take something away from them. Obviously, everyone here is pretty well established, so I listen to their podcasts, I read their books, their articles, whatever it may be. But you can literally learn something, good or bad, from most people that you interact with. And that can help with life, business, bodybuilding, really anything that you apply it to. So always be willing to learn from other people, from their mistakes, from their successes, and even step outside your comfort zone. Like I, you know, I'm, I own a business. I'm not a business person. I love Andy's podcast. I listen to that religiously. I've learned so much about business just from that podcast. And I wouldn't normally say to myself, oh, let me go listen to a business podcast. But it's relatable, it's applicable, and the message is very clear. So doing stuff outside your comfort zone and continuing to learn from all different sorts of people, again, good and bad, is my big takeaway for you guys.
Okay, so uh, first, just on the surface, um, staying in your lane is, is so important, and it's just something that, especially in the fitness industry, like you just you, you'll see all the time, like at uh, a very common level, like you see that personal trainer at the gym, and it's like it's like, dude, what are you doing? Like you don't, you're you're not a PT. Like stop cracking that person's neck or whatever it is, right? So. Stay in your lane and, 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 and focus on getting really good at, uh, at that thing. Um, and, and then, like, at a deeper level, probably stay in your lane in that, um, like, don't try to, you know, don't try to be John, don't try to be Cliff, you know, like, do your own thing. There's, like, certain aspects that you have that are unique to you that you can do better than anyone else. And I think whenever you try to just strictly emulate what someone else is doing, I'm, I'm going to be the next... You know, John Meadows, like, dude, you're not going to be the best you. So find what you're good at. And this, this applies for athletics, too. Like, Cliff, what if I told you that I was going to compete at 190 pounds and don't bring the mats this next time? You'd be like, dude, you're out of your mind. That's not what you do, bro. It's going to go really poorly for you. So, so yeah, when, when trying to establish yourself within this, in, this industry, how you stand out is using those things that are unique to you that you know you do very well and apply them to your passion. So it might not be anything similar to what we're doing here, but certainly like everyone here does a few things way better than I do, like milk that. Uh, so for mine, I hope this doesn't sound too harsh, but I think it's important. Uh, a lot of times, and I see this so often in the fitness industry, bodybuilders, coaching, business, um, always remember that the outside world is not going to judge you on your intentions they judge you on the result. Uh, there are so many people in the fitness industry with great intentions, but you know they don't educate. They want to help people, but they don't educate themselves, and they fuck people up. It's just the way it goes. Uh, they intended to do well, but they did harm. And you know, if, you know, some people think I worked out the hardest, and they get pissed off about their placing. Well, your result at the end of the day wasn't as good. You need to find a way to get a better result. Um, if you are a coach or a trainer and you have clients leaving you, it's because they feel they can get a better result somewhere else. Um, and you need to, don't, don't take offense to that. Just realize you, you need to get your results to match your intentions. And if you have great intentions, you can work your ass off to get those results. So, you know, I, I hope that doesn't sound too harsh, but always remember that, you know, other people don't fully know your intentions. They can only see the result. So, um, you know, if, if you feel like you're not getting what you deserve, then look at your result and see what people are seeing. So I'm going to hit two things really quick. So I'm going to talk from the business side of things because we have so many trainers and coaches. There's two things that I think are absolutely 100%. Damn it. The first thing is... Two things that you can really control. Every single person here, I'm a big believer in this. If you really do take the five people closest to you, you are literally the sum of those five people almost every time. I've talked to people about this. I've done it myself. I've looked back in time. If you're surrounding yourself with people that are sucking you dry and you're not able to fulfill your, pass your passion and pursue what you want, you've got to change the people that are around you, period. I've lost close, not lost them, but like I'm not close to some family members still, some of my best friends. But listen, I'm trying to create a legacy. Like, I'm trying to create something. Like, I've got kids, you know what I mean? Like, I want them to see, you know, you've built first form. I want them to see the stuff that I've built. So I'm trying to create that. You have to surround yourself with the right people. And the other thing is not, you know, listen, you may not have the best genetics in here. You may not be the best looking. I don't know why I'm looking at you when I say it. You may not be the best looking person to marry over your head or anything I'm like that. I'm not even the best looking person. What's up, family? Emily? So, listen. You can control one thing over everything else because there's going to be people smarter than you, people with much better physiques than you, people that are just better at certain things. The one thing that you control is you can work like extremely hard and control that every fucking day. And when you concentrate on that every day, listen to episode 107, win the day, learn how to use a power list. And when you concentrate on that every fucking day, working harder, knowing that you're working harder than the people next to you, that's what you should concentrate on. It builds momentum, and that's what will fucking get you there. Because when you start worrying about what everybody else has that you don't, nobody gives a fuck. It's not going to matter. So those two things that you control. Change the people around you if you have to, and concentrate on your shit and work as hard as you can. It's literally that simple. So... 
You guys are all in my home, and I'm very happy to have you here. Okay, you look around and you see like, you know, the cool office, and you know, you see some nice cars in the parking lot, and you see some success, and you see all of the shit that we have here, and all of the shit that we do online. And I want you to think about something. As I told you yesterday, all of those things were built from us putting other people first. Every single bit of success, every dollar, everything I value, every relationship, everything that I've ever accomplished that's positive in my life has come from putting other people first. And this industry is broken. This industry is run by massive egos. It's run by people who put other people down, who are worried about people looking at them as opposed to picking the people up that need the fucking help. And I, I don't have a piece of advice to give you, I have a challenge to give you. And my challenge is this. All of us are professionals in the fitness industry, which means that we're influencers. We may not have 10 million followers on the gram, we might have 200, it doesn't matter. But in your circle, in your family, you are an ambassador of fitness, and you are an ambassador of what this industry represents. And my challenge to you is this. Go out, dedicate as much time, as much energy, as much effort as you can to helping people be better. Don't worry about what finances you're gonna get back. Don't focus on how much money you're gonna make. Don't focus on what size business you can build. Worry about how you can fucking help people. Because this industry needs people to pick other people up and there's not enough people doing it. And that's what I have to say to you. <laughs> and I get to be the guy that follows that. So you should take the mic. Just drop it down. Uh, two, two short things that, that I was thinking about. I went through a, I went through a really, really tough spot from a, in, a, um, in one of my professional jobs in 2011. And one of the things that I learned from there is if you, if, you, if you always tell the truth and you always do right by people, you don't have to remember what you said or what you did. So I think that's important. Uh, and then I think nearly whether it's, it's, it's a dissertation, um, an education, building a business, working with a client, whatever it might be, I, I, I fundamentally feel like it's imperative that you, that you find value, you seek to enjoy the process and focus more on the process as opposed to the outcome. Because uh, I just feel like because there's 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 going to be successes, there's going to be failures, and each time that you if you focus more on the process, you'll be better. You'll be better in the end. Okay, so I know the two people. Leslie, you want to go ahead and shut that down? Go ahead and shut it down. So I actually have the. Two